aspects of the situation in Syria where um, my specialty comes into play. Um, uh, and it's been a very difficult situation, I think a great challenge to, to my profession. Uh, and there's great controversy within my profession uh, as to what the response to the situation in, in Syria uh, uh, should be. Um, uh, and there are, um, there are I think, three basic legal issues that, that uh, um, uh, have come to the fore. Um, one, probably the most important, is the question of, of the overall proper response of the international community to what is going on uh, in Syria. Uh, uh, should it be to, to sit back and watch? Should it be to uh, intervene in some way? Um, uh, uh, so that, that's one issue. The second issue um, that has come up in the course of the, of the uh, hostilities is that of chemical weapons. Uh, and and that's uh, uh, a major general issue in international law about how weapons should be, uh, weapons of that sort should be dealt with and what, uh, what the international response should be. Um, uh, and the third is the question of uh, international criminal prosecution, which is a possibility in this situation. That is, uh, if atrocities are being committed, uh, should that be dealt with at the international level uh, uh, or, or not? Um, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll add a fourth uh, as well, um, uh, the, what you might call the humanitarian situation and the, uh, the situation of people who are becoming displaced internally within Syria and people who are becoming displaced uh, uh, outside the, uh, the country. Uh, that's uh, already added on to my three. Um, and maybe some of you will think of additional uh, issues that, that I should put on. But um, on the first issue, the, the, the general proposition in international law has traditionally been that, uh, that foreign states, including the international community as a whole, should stay out of domestic situations. That is, when, when there is some kind of, of situation uh, in a country that leads to uh, hostilities, it, that it's really up to the people of that country to work it out, uh, and that others shouldn't get involved. Uh, and uh, in part, the rationale is that, uh, uh, that of the, the sovereignty or self-determination of the people of the state, that that should uh, determine the outcome of a political controversy. Um, um, uh, and I think a second uh, concern is that if outsiders get involved, that encourages other outsiders to get involved and you can escalate something that is initially a rather small situation into a major one. Uh, if you think, for example, of the Civil War in Spain going back to the 1930s, initially a domestic situation, and then you get people from the outside coming in on, on, in support of one side, and you get people from the outside in support of the other side, uh, and soon you, you have a, a much more uh, serious conflict. Um, uh, and also traditionally there has been skepticism about the motives of outside states that would get involved in a civil war. Because it's rare that some outside state is going to get involved militarily in a civil war out of benevolent motives. Uh, they're not going to uh, expend their, their financial resources and subject their soldiers to suffering and death uh, you know, for the benefit of the people of another country. Um, uh, so that's been a very serious consideration uh, that uh, has led to a general negative attitude towards outside intervention, uh, at least if the outside intervention uh, is what I would call unilateral in character, that is some individual outside state uh, coming in. Because you, you can recite many instances where there have been domestic situations and an outside state has come in uh, 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 and sometimes uh, uh, you know, purporting to do something of a humanitarian character, but it actually is, is there for, it, for its own uh, uh, interests. Um, now, that picture
nature has changed a bit in the last decade or so, I would say, maybe the last two decades. Uh, coming out of the situation in the Balkans, the fighting there with the breakup of Yugoslavia, um, uh, and the atrocities committed in, uh, in Somalia and in Rwanda and Africa in the 1990s, there came to be uh, a view that the international community has a responsibility in situations where uh, the, the domestic uh, circumstances are such that, uh, that there seem to be uh, uh, severe depredations against, the, against particular populations uh, uh, in, in that country. Uh, and that this is something that the international community should take on that it should do it in a collective way so that hopefully you wouldn't have outside states um, uh, pursuing their own agendas, you know, trying to, to you know, if, if they're interested in getting the oil in the country or whatever the, the motive might be. If you have it being done collectively, that, that all of those motives would, would, would fall away uh, and, and it would be done for the right uh, reasons. Um, and this uh, has, has acquired a name. Um, uh, it's called Responsibility to Protect. Uh, and if you look in the, the activities of the United Nations over the last few years, uh, you will see documents being written uh, promoting this idea, conferences being organized where, uh, where the idea is, is discussed. Um, uh, but the, the idea, I, I call it an idea, it hasn't really entered into the body of international law uh, as something that goes against the traditional notion of, of the sovereignty of the state. Um, um, as I say that, I, I should probably say that there are some in, in my field who would say that it has entered into that body. Uh, so that's why I say there's, there's controversy over this uh, topic. Um, the, the concern about going too far in that direction, um, uh, it, to some extent, one finds the same concerns uh, as with the antipathy towards unilateral uh, intervention, um, uh, that, that the outside states may, in fact, uh, uh, even if there are a number of them involved, may have their own reasons for doing it. Uh, typically, you're not going to find the international community as a whole deciding to go into a situation. Usually, it will be one or two states that promote the idea and then others uh, uh, go along with it. Uh, and so you may still have the phenomenon uh, of, uh, uh, of outside states that are not acting in, in the real uh, interests of preserving peace and, and protecting the uh, the population. Um, uh, the other concern with that concept uh, is that it, while it seems like a good idea, uh, uh, it may often not be feasible. That is, uh, even if there is a population group that seems to be severely at risk, uh, 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 that an outside force going in may wind up uh, leaving a situation that is worse than, than what you, you started with. Uh, because it's very difficult to go into a country as an outside force, to go in militarily, uh, protect the people that are uh, in trouble, and then, then pull out. Uh, we saw that, that phenomenon to some extent, I suppose, with Libya. And the, the intervention in Libya uh, a, a few years ago when the idea was to protect the population. The, the main uh, impetus for the international force to go in was that it was said that the government of Colonel Gaddafi uh, was planning to kill a lot of people in, in Tripoli, in the eastern part uh, of the country, uh, and, and that it was necessary to, uh, to take military action. There it wasn't an, a, a ground force, but, but from the air, uh, uh, to protect those people. Um, uh, so, a, a, an international uh, uh, effort was, was mounted along those lines. Um, I mean, it's one problem with that kind of situation 
uh, is that you never really know for sure what would have happened if there hadn't been an intervention. You know, uh, uh, there were statements being cited coming out of Colonel Gaddafi's circle saying, you know, we're really going to go after those people in Tripoli. Um, you know, maybe he was blowing smoke. I mean, uh, who knows whether that really would have happened. So it could be that that intervention uh, uh, didn't really uh, uh, protect anybody. And, 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 and one never really knows that after the fact, because you don't know for sure what would have happened uh, had, had the, the, the French and the British and the, the U.S. Uh, uh, taken that the action uh, taking the action they did. The other other problem uh, uh, is that in that kind of situation, um, it, it's hard to confine the action uh, to a protective mode. That is, the, the rationale for that action was to protect a certain population. Now, in a situation perhaps like Libya, perhaps in others, uh, you can say, well, the only way to protect a population that is under threat is to get rid of the people that are, uh, are creating the threat, uh, which can be getting rid of the government. And that's more or less what happened uh, in Libya. Uh, that is, that, that the mission was initiated with the idea of protecting the people uh, uh, in the Tripoli area, um, uh, and it, it wound up uh, acting in support in general of those who were uh, uh, interested in, in overturning the government, uh, uh, and that's what, what happened. Now, uh, now, one can say, you know, maybe that's a good thing, maybe that was the only way to protect the population. Um, uh, but uh, it has created some difficulty, in particular in relation to Syria, uh, because governments, especially the government of Russia, uh, uh, say, you know, we were, we were deceived with respect to the Libya uh, intervention. We went along with it, uh, and then the Western countries uh, did something more. They did more than, than what they claimed they were going to do. Uh, um, uh, and if there were to be something similar in Syria, that might happen as well. Now, other, you know, you might well say, well, that would be a good thing in Syria, uh, uh, but uh, um, hopefully it would be decided at the outset what the purpose is. Uh, um, I, and the international community in general has, has well, it, it has shown some inclination uh, towards this responsibility to protect and to protect populations that seem to be uh, under threat. Uh, really hasn't embraced the idea uh, of going into countries to throw out bad governments. Uh, because when you throw out, if you can define what a bad government is, uh, uh, but uh, if you can throw that government out, you don't know what, uh, what comes after. Um, and, and with Libya, the consequences are not all that great. The country is not united. There are militia around. There is militia that just had some oil that they got onto a tanker and, and got onto the Mediterranean and it was uh, now just intercepted by the United States a couple of days ago and uh, on the theory that it was being stolen from the, the, the legitimate government of, uh, of Libya uh, and the, the ship was turned around and is now going back to, uh, to port, I think, in, in, in uh, uh, either uh, Tripoli, I haven't seen Tripoli, I meant Benghazi. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you should correct me <laughs> when I, if I make a mistake, correct me. Uh, yeah. um, the um, so so there are those um, uh, considerations that the the international community is concerned about, and that's why this this doctrine uh, remains controversial. Um, uh, the. Um, uh, the Obama administration, of course, at one point with respect to Syria, uh, said that it was appropriate to send in a military force uh, to deal with, with the uh, uh, situation of the use of chemical weapons. So that, that was, was being talked about as uh, a military action that would not be general, and that is to get involved generally in what was going on, but, but for that purpose. Uh, uh, whether that could have been accomplished, I suppose we'll, you know, we'll never know because eventually that uh, 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 scenario did not uh, play itself out. Uh, uh, as we saw, uh, 
the, uh, the members of the U.S. Congress were not uh, 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 interested in, in doing that. They didn't see a, a, a need to, uh, and the president uh, did not press it. I mean, often U.S. presidents have gone ahead and done things of that sort and just uh, you know, told the Congress about it after the fact. Uh, um, you know, president Obama decided not to do that for, for whatever reason. Um, um, uh, so, so that can be a very serious uh, obstacle to doing this kind of thing. That is that the, the executive branch of the government may be willing to do it, uh, but there might not be uh, domestic political support uh, for doing it. So, uh, so you have this doctrine, um, uh, responsibility to protect uh, you'll often see it uh, written now as uh, capital R with a numeral two and then a capital capital P. So that's kind of the, it, it's entered into the jargon uh, of international law in that respect. So if you you see that rather strange looking uh, capital R numeral two capital P, it means responsibility to protect, and it's this, this doctrine that I'm, I'm talking about. The other uh, limitation on the doctrine, even as conceived by its proponents, uh, is that the, the, the mission should be feasible, um, uh, which means, for example, uh, uh, you know, if you find people in, in a major power, let's say like China, uh, who are under threat, uh, do you send in a military force? Well, probably not. China's too powerful, it's not going to work. Uh, so it, it's a doctrine that has very serious limitations. It's not one you can uh, elevate to the, to the point of principle and say it should always be, be done. Um, uh, it's obviously not going to be done against major powers. It can only be done against uh, uh, countries who, whose military uh, is not sufficiently strong to, uh, to uh, effectively oppose what's going on. Um, uh, so. So that is the, the general uh, uh, realm of issues that relate uh, around this notion to, of responsibility uh, to uh, protect. Um, but uh, as, as we've seen with, with the Syria situation, the, the, the international response, uh, in a way, got diverted uh, from, from that kind of issue uh, to the question of chemical weapons. Um, uh, and, and that's another uh, very significant issue in terms of international law. Uh, there has been a, a, a concept going back to the early 20th century uh, that certain kinds of weapons are impermissible in warfare. Uh, this has always been a very difficult subject for me to comprehend because uh, there are many ways to kill people. Uh, uh, so what we're talking about is distinguishing nice ways of killing people from not so nice ways of killing people. Uh, and that's a rather uncomfortable exercise. Um, but the idea is that weapons that are indiscriminate in nature uh, should be prohibited. And historically, the, the, the prohibition uh, largely comes out of the experience of the First World War, when, when chemical weapons, gas uh, uh, warfare, it, it was called then, uh, was used rather widely and wound up killing large numbers of, of people. And that led in the 1920s to the development of, a, uh, of some international treaties on the subject, uh, there was one in particular on chemical weapons called the Protocol on I think, Asphyxiating Gases, they, they, they called it at the time. Um, uh, so you got the development of, of an international norm uh, against the use of, of, of those kinds of weapons. This whole body of law is one that is, is very difficult in terms of enforcement and implementation. That is, how do you uh, ensure that, that uh, particular kinds of weapons are not going to be used, um, uh, um, short of having some kind of international uh, police force. Uh, in the Second World War, as it turned out, gas uh, uh, or asphyxiating gases, uh, chemical weapons, weren't used very much. It seems largely because 
uh, each side had them, and, and he, there was a kind of deterrence that went on uh, against initiating uh, the, the, their use. Um, but uh, at the same time, you had a large number of countries that were developing these weapons. Uh, the United States developed them and still has a very substantial stocks of chemical uh, weapons. They're kept in a fort in, in Maryland. Uh, and uh, uh, after the Second World War, uh, even though th these weapons hadn't been, been used during that war, uh, there was an idea to kind of build on the, the, the 1925 treaty about asphyxiating gases uh, and to develop a system that would not only say there is a prohibition against using these weapons, but that there is a prohibition on even having them in the first place, uh, and that if you have them, you need to, uh, uh, to get rid of them. Uh, and that was the, uh, uh, the, the goal of a treaty, a, a multilateral treaty, that then uh, came into being around 1969 or so, uh, a, a chemical weapons treaty that, um, that said that uh, it's illegal to use these weapons uh, and it is illegal to uh, possess them uh, and that a committee would be established, as it was under the treaty, uh, to work with states that had uh, stockpiles of these weapons uh, to, uh, uh, to see that they would be uh, destroyed to oversee the destruction. And this is the committee that's now involved in, in, in Syria uh, dealing with the question of, of, of destruction of, of those uh, uh, weapons. Um, so uh, this, this treaty, you know, has a number of problems with it. One, one is how to define what is a chemical weapon. Uh, uh, and I actually never had occasion to look at this treaty closely until the situation developed uh, in Syria. Uh, uh, and uh, when you read it, um, the definition is so broad that, you know, a can of Lysol uh, could be considered a chemical weapon, almost any chemical that can kill anybody. You know, a pesticide, uh, 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 it's really quite uh, uh, strange that they didn't develop a definition that, that was more uh, narrow. This probably isn't a critical issue as regards what's going on in Syria because some of the, the weaponry that, uh, that has been located there is, uh, is, is much more serious than, than that sort of thing. Uh, but we do, in fact, have a court case going on now in, uh, where is it, in, in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, where a, a woman, uh, is charged with violating the Chemical Weapons Convention. The Chemical Weapons Convention has now been written into U.S. law, so it's a, it's a crime in the United States to possess uh, or use a chemical weapon. Uh, and this woman uh, was upset because uh, her husband was having an affair with another woman, and she apparently tried to kill the other woman by putting some chemical on the, on the doorknob of the woman's house, figuring that the woman would touch it and, and, uh, and be killed. Uh, and she has been prosecuted for violation of, 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 of chemical warfare uh, prohibitions uh, and is now, now in jail. Uh, a bit strange, I mean, she obviously could have been prosecuted just for murder or assault or something, but prosecutors didn't have to do that, uh, but, it, but it, it came about rather strangely uh, because the, um, the prosecutors in the state, I think it was Pennsylvania, uh, didn't want to, to prosecute her. They didn't think the evidence was strong enough to prosecute her, but the federal prosecutor did think it was uh, a case to be prosecuted, but under federal law, there was, there's, there's not, a, it's not, murder isn't a crime. Uh, but chemical weapons is a crime, so the prosecutor decided to prosecute it as a chemical weapons crime. Uh, anyway, that's just an interesting story that really has nothing to do with Syria. But uh, uh, as regards Syria, the, uh, uh, the agreement was reached with the government that it would give over its, its chemical weapon stocks. Uh, and uh, a timetable was set up, and this is 
uh, often what is done with the committee under the, the, the set up under this uh, treaty uh, that the uh, uh, that a timetable would be set up and a procedure whereby the the weapons would be uh, destroyed. Now, both Russia and the United States have arrangements of that kind with the uh, with the committee. In both instances, the timetable is over a period of decades uh, to destroy them. Uh, with Syria, uh, it was a period of months, uh, and that was the first time that that the committee ever tried to. Uh, destroy a, a, a stockpile within a very short period of time. And I think the considerations were, you know, that the concern that, that, that the weapons uh, were being used, uh, being used presently, whereas the, those that exist in Russia and the United States are just, you know, sitting in some remote location, uh, but they're, they're not an immediate threat to, to anyone. So there was certainly a rationale for trying to do that quickly with regard to Syria. Um, uh, and that is being done. And in the news from time to time, you'll see reports on, on the progress. Uh, and sometimes you'll see reports that are critical of the Syrian government for not moving fast enough. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the international personnel are, are on the ground. and. and uh, and I think at this point they have managed to destroy the, the production facilities, facilities to produce weapons, but the, the actual uh, stockpiles of weapons themselves uh, uh, are still there in various places uh, in Syria. Uh, and the government is saying that, uh, that it's the, the, the conditions of civil war that make it very difficult to, uh, to get them all together and get them safely to uh, to some location, a lot of them are they're being taken to Latakia and put on, on ships, and, and the United States is, is in effect donating uh, 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 vessels that have the equipment to uh, to destroy the the weapons. I mean, they're destroyed through chemical means, um, uh, but you obviously have to be very careful about how it's done. So it's a very uh, technic technically technically. Uh, difficult uh, operation. Um, uh, so uh, you, you see uh, conflicting reports from time to time on whether the Syrian government uh, is dragging its feet or, or, or is not. Um, um, one of the um, aspects of that process is that the, the Russian government and the United States government uh, have, have worked rather closely together in putting pressure on the government of Syria uh, to, to do this. Uh, uh, it, it was, if you recall, in fact, the, the Russian government that at a certain point came up with the idea uh, at a point in time when President Obama was saying uh, we need to use military force uh, in Syria and Congress was saying we're not so sure. Uh, it was at that point that the idea came up uh, of, of, of destruction, uh, of, of voluntary destruction of the chemical weapons by the, the government of, of Syria. Uh, so, um, so that cooperation has been quite important. Uh, and in that regard, I'm a bit concerned that now Russia and the United States uh, are not on such good terms. So you may have heard, unless you, you live in a cave, uh, you probably have heard that Russia and the United States uh, are, are having some problems these days. Uh, problems which, to my mind, are not necessary. I think, I think the people in Crimea should do whatever they want to do. If they want to be part of China, that's fine with, with me. Uh, but it's apparently not fine with, with the, uh, the, the government of the United States or with the, most of the Western European governments. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, it has led to a confrontational situation between Russia uh, and the United States, uh, which uh, is, is very likely to have implications for cooperation between Russia and the United States uh, uh, on, on the Syrian issue. Um, uh, and I, you know, so that that's an additional complicating circumstance, and I don't know exactly how that is going to. Uh, uh, to play itself out. Uh, but in any event, that, that's item number two, is the chemical weapons. 
Uh, item number three. Good, I didn't make any mistakes in that. Number six. Good, thank you. Okay, item number three, uh, international criminal prosecution. This is another tool, you might say, uh, at the hands of the international community uh, to deal with uh, atrocities that are, are committed uh, in, anywhere, uh, and in particular in the course of a, of a civil conflict, like the conflict in, in Syria. Um, uh, about, uh, well, about a decade ago now, uh, a court was established uh, at the international level uh, by a treaty that was entered into by a large number of states of the world uh, for the purpose of prosecuting persons who commit atrocities. Uh, and the idea was that, uh, uh, that individual countries are, are not likely to be in a position to prosecute uh, often, uh, that often atrocities are being committed by a government which is not going to to prosecute its own people, uh, and uh, it, that it might be helpful as a way of, of, of reducing atrocities to provide for uh, prosecution uh, at the international level. Now, uh, it, is, it has always been the posture of the international community to try to put pressure on states not to commit atrocities. The whole uh, uh, the body of law that's called human rights developed in the mid 20th century with that idea in mind, to put pressure on states not to torture people, not to arrest people for no reason, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but in the late 20th century, the idea gains momentum that in addition to putting pressure on states, it, is, it might be helpful to put pressure on the individuals, uh, and we're talking about individuals high up in, in either governments or, or civil movements, rebel movements, uh, to put pressure on those individuals, uh, that that might be an additional and perhaps more effective deterrent uh, so that you know, the president of some country can't say, well, I'm going to like, we'll kill some people and uh, I'm the president and nothing will be done against me, uh, uh, even if some countries take trade sanctions against the state, that, that's not going to hurt me. Uh, the idea was to put pressure on the, uh, on the individuals. Uh, so, um, this court was set up, uh, and, and this uh, uh, came into being, as I say, about 10 years ago. Um, uh, and that is one possibility in the Syrian situation. Um, uh, the United Nations has a, an official who is responsible for human rights, uh, and as long as maybe two years ago, she was saying that the president of Syria should be prosecuted before the International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, now there, there are a number of problems with, with doing that. One is that uh, this court uh, has jurisdiction that is not worldwide. Its jurisdiction is based on the states that actually become parties to the treaty that establishes the court. So if a state becomes a party to that treaty, then uh, war crimes and genocide, uh, those kinds of things committed in its territory are subject to prosecution in the, in the International Criminal Court, which means that the, the prosecutor at the court can issue an indictment uh, against someone uh, for atrocities in that uh, country. Uh, uh, and once that is done, all the states that are party to the treaty have an obligation, if they have the opportunity, to arrest that person and send that person to, uh, to the court, which is based in the Netherlands and the Hague, uh, for, for trial. Um, so the, the jurisdiction is is in general based on uh, the adherence of particular states to the treaty. Now, as it happens, Syria is not a party to that treaty. So that doesn't uh, allow the prosecutor to go uh, uh, investigate whether uh, Mr. al-Assad or others in Syria, uh, on whatever side of the conflict, uh, could be uh, guilty of, of atrocities. There is another way 
that the court can get jurisdiction, and that is, uh, and this is provided for in the treaty that, that sets up the court, uh, and that is that the UN Security Council can decide that a particular situation calls for prosecution, even if it relates to a state that is not a party to the treaty. So to that extent, the, the jurisdiction of the court is potentially worldwide, but in the particular situation, it, it requires that the Security Council uh, act uh, and, and confer jurisdiction on the court uh, for what's going on in the particular state. Uh, this has not been done very much. Um, uh, it was done prominently uh, in Sudan a few years ago. Uh, with respect to the situation in the western part of, of Sudan where there were uh, allegations of widespread atrocities in the course of a conflict uh, involving the government on one side and some uh, movements for, well, uh, for change, let's say, on the other. Um, uh, and uh, Sudan, uh, like Syria, was not a, a, a party to the statute, but the Security Council adopted a resolution uh, giving the International Criminal Court uh, jurisdiction over acts in the territory of Sudan. Uh, and on that basis, the, the prosecutor has now issued indictments, I, get, I think, against three people, uh, one of whom is the president of Sudan. So the president of Sudan uh, is under indictment uh, in the International Criminal Court. So, in principle, that similarly could be done with respect to Syria. That is, the Security Council could adopt a resolution uh, conferring jurisdiction on the court, uh, and then the court could, could issue indictments against anyone that it wants to uh, in, in Syria. Uh, that is not likely to happen uh, because the Security Council, uh, as you may be aware, operates on the basis of of unanimity of the five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, France, Britain, China, Russia, and the United States. So all five of them would have to agree. Uh, uh, and it's unlikely that Russia, and I'm not sure about China, would, would go along with that. Uh, so, so this idea uh, really has not been pursued in a serious way by any of the governments involved, uh, in part for that reason. Um, but, but there's another, another problem as well uh, with, with using a criminal prosecution in the course of, a, you know, when, when you're in, a, in a, a civil confrontation situation. And that is uh, that it makes it very difficult to work out a negotiated settlement uh, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're prosecuting one of the, the, the principal figures on one side, or maybe on both sides, uh, uh, that have to come together uh, and 